Lord, we are thankful to be able to come together again this evening and to open your word. Lord, we're thankful for the tremendous relevance that it has and the way that it gives such clear explanations and examples that set forth uh, how we should think and how we should walk and live. Lord, we just pray that you would bless this evening. We do pray for Megan's recovery from surgery. God, that you would grant her just a, a rapid and recovery without any uh, complications or difficulties. Lord, we pray that you'd just continue to be with us and bless our time together in the word this evening. Pray also for Daniel as he will be uh, bringing the word tomorrow. We thank you that Megan's sister will be able to come and kind of look after her while he serves at TSTC. So we thank you for making that possible and just, just ask for your hand over everything, Lord. We are so dependent upon you and off take it for granted. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Now I know this one looks like there's a bunch of pieces on top. There are lessons learned from the analogy of a citizen. Sojourners, strangers, and exiles. Now these things are all somewhat related notions in the scripture because if you're not a citizen of a place, but you are there, then you are an exile there or a sojourner there or a stranger. These things link together. Next week, I anticipate, will be the last of our lessons from analogies. And that will be on the lessons from the analogy of a servant and a wife. Some may not be thrilled that I put those together in one lesson. <laughs> but the idea is that wonderful thing that as the church is to submit to the Lord in all things. That example that's given there in the scriptures. And so that will tie things together very nicely. But let's look today at the idea of citizens, sojourners, strangers, and exiles. One of the other things that this lesson will do is it will, it will tie into some other thoughts in terms of uh, history, heritage, and background and put some pieces together that hopefully will help us. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, which we'll see the larger section of that a bit later, says this, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The term citizen there is polituma, which you can see laid out there for you. It carries the idea of a civic entity, a commonwealth. It is a place of citizenship or a homeland. So our homeland isn't here. There used to be a, a hymn that people sang back in the day. Uh, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through, you know. Yeah, but it's not, this world is not my home. Yeah, and, it, and we don't sing that anymore, but there is health to, to those thoughts that this is not ultimately where our roots lay. And there, there is, there is a, there is a unity. There is a binding. There is a family. There is a heritage wrapped up in Christ and in the and in the faith that's stronger than the flesh. And it's a, it's a beautiful picture. This word here for citizenship used in now the word citizen appears in another place, but the word citizenship here in Philippians three twenty is a hapex legomena which Doug loves to point those out on Sunday mornings, you know. And, and that's a word that appears only once in the scripture. Now, one thing I do want to note about this particular use of the word citizenship, it, it says this, our, the verse says, our citizenship. So the our is a plural pronoun, right? And so we know that, that he's speaking to a group of them, but the term citizenship is in the singular. So it's carrying the sense that, uh, that each of us, all of us, individually are citizens of heaven. That it is a very particular and a very personal matter. Now let's begin to unfold a few thoughts here. Paul and the Philippians were Roman citizens. 
Okay, Philippi was one of those cities that would be, you would be a Roman citizen. Paul speaks of his citizenship in Acts 21, 39. Paul says, it says he replied to the uh, soldier at that time who is taking him under arrest, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. Now, this is one of, there's an interesting thing woven in here, and the history gets a bit muddy, and I'm just, it's hard to know who to believe in terms of the trace of the history. But from what we understand, best I could make out, Tarsus was what was called a free city. A free city was one that often uh, had tremendous educational, tremendous artistic endeavors. It was like a major pinnacle center of intelligence and art and beauty. And everyone born in those cities was automatically a citizen. You might be born elsewhere in the Roman Empire. You were not automatically a citizen. You were a people under Roman rule, but you weren't a citizen necessarily. So this is a, a significant thing. We see the significance of it when in Acts 22, the tribune came to him, to Paul, and says, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Because they were getting ready to whip him. And he says, and he had said, are you going to whip a Roman citizen without him being tried? And so he comes and asks him, and he says to him, this long, extensive answer, yes. Sometimes that's the best answer, right? Yes, no, no need to elaborate on that. Oh, that people's words would be fewer. They might be more accurate than they often are. But the, the tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. He surely would have been born in the Roman Empire, but nonetheless did not get citizenship by birth and to become a person of some prominence who could get put into the position of a tribune. He had to purchase his citizenship. And Paul says, but I am a citizenship, a citizen by birth. And so even as they're interacting, there is, and you know how humans work, right? There's still this tendency to say this. I mean, you've met a human somewhere. But there's this tendency to say this. I'm a citizen by birth. You're just a citizen by purchase. I have been a citizen since day one. You became a citizen. You're second class citizen. I'm first class citizen, right? At least business class. <laughs> so that idea throws itself out there. And here's the beauty that we're going to see. We are also, in a sense, citizens of heaven by birth. Not physical birth, but I actually put what's interesting, kind of both work for us. Christ purchased our citizenship and then because of that, we're born again. So we kind of got double, you know? We're dual citizens of heaven. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> that doesn't even make sense. I get it. <laughs> I'm just doubling down. Let me go. <laughs> uh, so, it, you know, it's a beautiful picture. Now, I want to go into a few things that show us something unexpected and shocking. In Psalm 87, 2 to 6, we have a prophetic passage, a prophetic passage that does not immediately make logical sense. I mean, it's the kind of prophecy that when someone would read it, they would their first thing that they would say when they're done reading it would be, what? What? And then be confused and move on without understanding it usually. Isn't that what most people do? <laughs> well, listen as it reads. Again, uh, part of this verse got cut off, but I, mainly from verse 3 is the emphasis. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. Just as a little information, city of God is more important than Tarsus in Cilicia. More important than 
Rome, more important than Athens. You know, the big cities that if you were born there, you would have those citizenships right away, even a Philippi. So here you go. Um, Glorious things have spoken to you, O city of God. Among those who know me. Now this is the psalmist speaking from the perspective of God under the influence of the Spirit. Among those who know me. I mention Rahab and Babylon. Now, for those who don't know, Rahab is a biblical reference to Egypt, even though we think it's a reference to Jericho. You know, it may be because of the tragic profession of Rahab and Jericho and the tremendous idolatry that took place in Egypt. They, you know, idolatry is often linked with those kinds of uh, immoral practices in the scripture. So here we have, so he's referring to who? People from Egypt, people from Babylon. Then it says, behold, Philistia and Tyre and Cush. So here are people, and, and here's how you know where they're from. They're in Babylon. Where do you think the people in Babylon are from? I know you're thinking this is a trick question. Yeah. It's not. Where do you think the people in Philistia are from? Yeah, it's pretty obvious. That's where they're from. But then look at what it says after it says Cush. This one was born there. That's a reference to the city of God. They say, and of Zion the city of God, it shall be said what? This one and that one from Egypt, from Babylon, this one and that one, which again speaks of individual rather than the whole group or the whole community, right? People from out of Philistia, out of Tyre, this one and that one were born in her. What? For the Most High himself will establish her. And then verse 6 adds this interesting phrase, the Lord records as he registers the peoples, this one was born there. So here's the confusion. The earthly birth certificate says, born in Babylon. <laughs> and yet God records them this one was born in Zion, the city of God. It's like, well, is God wrong? Of course he's not wrong, but it, it, it seems mysterious at this point. And if you were to attempt to read rabbis trying to deal with this, oh my, what a confusion it is. Because we only understand it now as we get to look back on it from the New Testament in light of the fullness of Christ. And we come to understand that Zion itself is a reference that points us to Christ and the church that is built upon him. As I say here in the notes, this is not a reference to physical birth or earthly Zion, but a spiritual reference to the heavenly city, country. And we have it stated like this. And I'm glad we get the opportunity to do this because I briefly referenced these things from a verse on Sunday, but we didn't get time to go into it. Here we will. First Peter 2.6 says this, for it stands in Scripture. Now just a hint. If it stands in Scripture, it stands. There ain't no way around it. If the Word of God has declared something, then it is. What if the majority of people in the world disagree? Yet they're wrong. You know? <laughs> what if everybody in the world disagrees? Yeah, wrong. And everybody's wrong. Is it possible that everybody could be a liar and wrong and only God proved true? Yes. Absolutely. We're told that in Romans, aren't we? Yes. Even if everyone is a liar, God proves true. Now, he says, so this stands in Scripture. So 
wanting us to also know this as it's bringing across this statement from the Old Testament. And I did not immediately put the reference here, but I'm sure you can, for fun, locate that Old Testament reference. But what I want us to know this, it stands in Scripture, which means that some people will sometimes say, and be careful of this, um, all right, this was God's plan, and uh oh didn't work out. I mean, sometimes people will do that. They'll say God's plan, he, he was, what he wanted to do was make Israel his people and, and save them and, and nobody else, but they just wouldn't obey. They just wouldn't obey. They just kept breaking the covenant. So finally God is like, ha, huh, what will I do? Okay, here's what I'll do. I'll put them aside, my real plan, and I'll, and I'll make the church instead. And, and they start to come up with these kinds of ideas. It's like, no, because one, that makes God way less than omniscient and way short of wise, which is not the case. And when you have beautiful verses like this, it stands in Scripture is indicating this was always the plan. And actually, we're going to see how this is always the plan. Even in Abraham, in you, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. It was always the plan, even before there was such a thing as Hebrews. Before there was such a thing as Jews. Because actually, technically, Abraham wasn't a Jew. Right? He's from Ur of the Chaldeans. So... He'd be a Chaldean likely, not a, a Jew. His descendants would later be called that, but not him. Let's keep going. Stands in scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion. The I am is the work of God. Laying in Zion a stone. Okay, this is confusing. He's laying in Zion a stone. What is this stone? It is a cornerstone chosen and precious. So it is a cornerstone, and with regard to this cornerstone, it says this, whoever believes in him. So I'm going to ask you to take a wild guess at who is this cornerstone. Jesus. Yes, that's, we, we know that, right? Jesus is the cornerstone, whoever believes in him. So he is the cornerstone, and then it will be the Zion will be built on him. Who is the cornerstone upon which the foundation of the apostles and prophets are laid? And no other foundation can be laid. For that is the body of Christ, indeed the church of Christ. So Zion is, it, it, oftentimes, and this sometimes confuses people because sometimes someone will read in the Old Testament a prophecy and promise of God regarding Zion and then they get insistent. That must mean this mountain, physically in this place. I say, slow down. You have to at least say, it might mean this mountain, or it might mean the people of God in Christ, the church. You've got to at least say, when the New Testament says, when, when the Old Testament said, I'm laying in Zion a stone, it wasn't talking about that place exclusively, physically, it was talking about the spiritual church that would be laid. Let's look even further. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, is differentiating between the old covenant and the mountain that was part of the old covenant and the new covenant. It says, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. To which we might say to ourselves, I've not come to Mount Zion. I don't know if any of you maybe have traveled there, but he's saying this to all of the believers. How have they all come to Mount Zion? Well, some did it because down the street is Mount Zion Baptist Church, right? And so that's how they got there. No, that doesn't cover it. <laughs> but... but Again, the idea, and just so that we, you understand the spiritual nature, the city of the living God, well, that could still be physical. And then it says the heavenly Jerusalem. He just took the location of this Zion, this heavenly Jerusalem, and, and did what? 
It's not an earthly Jerusalem. It is a heavenly Jerusalem, a Jerusalem from above, as it says in Galatians chapter 4, which we will get to in a bit. Hebrews further says this regarding those people in the Old Testament in the hall of faith who were obedient and they did mighty things in the name of God. They sacrificed much. They served. They had victory over lions and all kinds of amazing things. And it says of these people, which would include Abraham, which would include Sarah, which would include Moses, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised. <laughs> but having seen them and greeted them from afar and have acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus, so we're beginning to take up already the idea of strangers, exiles, sojourners. People who speak thus, people who speak in this way, <coughs> this world is my, not my home. I am a sojourner. One of, uh, the, one of the King James words in these places is pilgrim. Right? I'm a pilgrim. Uh, but then that does confuse Americans. They start, start, start to think of buckles on hats and all kinds of, you know. <laughs> and we are working our way towards Thanksgiving, and that's even more distracting. So stay with me. But what? Make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. So it's like, I want a homeland. But what's the homeland they want? Is it here on this earth? It says if it had been... Uh, thinking of land that they had gone out of, they would have had the opportunity to return. Page 16 at the top, verse 16. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Now, these things get confused because it, 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 it's not the way that we would speak. Is it a better country or is it a better city? I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and it's the peculiar thing. Both of these ideas work together. It is, it is like a city. It is like a country. It carries these things. It is heavenly. It is a thought is this is not where I lay down my stakes. This is not what my life is all about. It is mostly about the heavenly one. And as such... Our truest family is what? Those who share that journey to that heavenly kingdom. Now, being a citizen came with certain rights and privileges. In Acts 22, verse 25, when they, when they had stretched him out for whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawfully for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? So they had certain rights and privileges that they could demand because Paul was a Roman citizen when they would want to judge him or want to put him to death. He could do something that the ordinary guy, the ordinary Jew couldn't do. He could say, I appeal to Caesar. And then what? Now they have to let him go to Rome. They have to take him to Rome and he gets to appeal to Caesar and Caesar will render the judgment. If a Jew says, I appeal to Caesar, you know what they say? Yeah, get lost, <laughs> turn around. If a Jew just shows up in Rome and says, I want to an audience with Caesar, get lost. But a, a Roman citizen, particularly by birth, had the right to be able to have an audience and a hearing from Caesar. What, what a glorious analogy that is, isn't it? A citizen of heaven has the right and privilege to what? Have an audience and draw near to and have a hearing from God himself. Oh my, yeah, thank you, Lord. Paul had once been proud, maybe to some degree of his Roman citizenship, but even more so of his Hebrew heritage. Wasn't he, in his youth, very strongly thrilled with himself in his heritage? It says this in Philippians chapter 3, Though I myself have reason to be confident in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. 
because he was Jew in the purest sense. Some were culturally, but they're not going to make sure that they're circumcised on the eighth day. You know, approximately within the first eight months, we'll get you done, you know. But what he means, even before he was knowledgeable, he, he has been following the structure. If anyone else has a reason, me, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, which people might like to say, where did the first king come from? Anyone want to guess which tribe the first king came from? Benjamin. Obviously not a trick question because I just said of the tribe of Benjamin. Right? The question would make no sense if Benjamin wasn't the answer. <laughs> so thank you for following. And then he says, a Hebrew of the Hebrews which kind of almost carries the sense of this. Though he's a Roman citizen, he is raised. He's, he's got the curly cues on the edges of his beard. His beard is not rounded off. He's got the tassels on his, on his clothes. He dresses like he does his hair and apparel like, and you immediately look at him and know that man's a Jew. That is a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Those of you who have traveled from time to time, you may not always be able to uh, spot a Jew, you know, unless they're wearing a I'm from Hollywood t-shirt or secondarily, they might be wearing very clear apparel. If they got a little kappa on there, it's like, okay, this is a Jew. Or if they've got a bigger hat and they've got the curls coming down and the long coat, it, you immediately when you're traveling, you, you, you say that, is a Jew. That is a Hebrew. You just know it because they have distinguished themselves visibly. Paul was so committed to all of these kinds of things. As to the law, a Pharisee, the most legalistic of all of the people. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. It get more zealous than that. Here is one who is looking to say that the Gentiles are welcomed into the presence of God. There is no difference between Jew, Gentile, slave, free, barbarian, Scythian. Oh, no, 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 no. They want to shut down the church, don't they? Well, as to righteousness, please note he says, under the law, blameless. Does that mean he never broke any of those laws? No, it meant under the law, when you broke those laws, you gave a sin offering. You gave a goodwill offering. So there were ways to cleanse and cover. So every time sin, he, he was rigorous that when he misstepped, he did the necessary steps of sacrifice so that he would be considered blameless. I mean, this is in. Hence, he would have been a, a, a rare percentage, you know, he would have been, you know, the probably the elite percentage, even among those who would call themselves Pharisees, you know, intense. That's why he was at the feet of Gamaliel. That's why he was one who was going to be that kind of a Gamaliel type teacher, the next leader of those kinds of people. So he was... Let me just simply summarize this. The best of the best. Okay, he was the top gun of Hebrews. That's the way Renee wants to hear it. <laughs> but not, you know, but he was the, the absolute most committed. But then what does he say in verse 7? Whatever gain I had. And what it... And you know that there was, there was pride in that, thinking he's better than everyone else. Pharisees were well known for their pride and for their looking down on others. And he was among the best. So he, whatever he had, he now counts as what? Lost, dumb, it's useless. So he sees all of those things that he thought were so meaningful, so significant before, that made him acceptable to God, that made him better than others. He now looks at those things and say, nothing. It gets me nothing. I count them lost for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything 
loss. I like that because it's not just the, those things previously, but even the subsequent things that he's done, he doesn't think, now I've proven worthy. Now I'm good enough. No, my only acceptance is in Christ. My only forgiveness is in Christ. My only access is in Christ. Yeah, I've worked harder than all of the rest, but nevertheless, not I, but the grace of God in me. Because of the, so everything is lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And here's a simple reality. Once by grace we come to know Christ Jesus, our Lord, there is no place we will ever look upon ourselves again and say, I'm good. No, that's not going to happen. Because once you know Christ, it's like, I've got a long way to go. Still got a long way to go, you know. It, it is, yeah, we are. The, he, he went from best to the best to chief of sinners. That's a, you know, that's in, in his own estimation, didn't he? He's like, okay, I thought I was on top, and now I think maybe I was actually on the bottom. Now we might put him somewhere else, but the whole point is, it is all Christ that matters. For his sake I've suffered the loss of all things. Count them as rubbish, garbage, dung, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ and that which depends on faith. So what we're, what we're starting to understand is this, is a righteousness under the law, he doesn't count that as valuable anymore. The Hebrew of the Hebrews doesn't count that as valuable anymore. Now it is the righteousness that is his by faith in Christ that matters more than anything. Now let's, it, he says also in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty two, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. So he's got that. Okay. But now in Christ, with spiritual understanding, uh, the divinely purposed significance of Jew and offspring of Abraham, and even circumcision takes on a different and deeper meaning. Why do I say that? Well, let's see. Romans chapter 4, verse 13 and following. The promise to Abraham and his offspring is what? That he would be heir of the world. Well, that's pretty significant, isn't it? Heir of the world. And it did not come through the law. Because this was a promise made to Abraham before the law even existed, before Jews even existed, before any of those things. And it says this, uh, but it came through what? The righteousness of faith. That is why it depends on faith. What we're going to come to understand is this. You know who is, in the eyes of God, considered the offspring of Abraham? Those who share the faith of Abraham. It depends on faith. In order that what? The promised may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. Not only the ones of Jewish background, adherents of the law, who have faith, but also what? The one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Us all who believe, Jews and Gentiles alike. Trace it out further. Romans 9, 7 and 8 says the unthinkable and the biologically impossible because it's speaking spiritually with regard to the grace and promises of God. Romans 7, 9. Not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. Is that how biology works? How does biology work? You're his child, because you're his offspring. These are synonyms biologically. But here it's being said, that, so, so where's he going with this? You know, well, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Okay, so not through the slave woman Hagar's child, but through Isaac the child will be named, even though the other one, is also a descendant, right? A child, right? 
but not for the purposes of God regarding them as children or offspring of Abraham. That's why, and, and to explain it so we understand he's talking spiritually, he says it this way in verse 8. That means, I'm always thankful for God kindly doing this for us in the yeah. scriptures. You know, so, okay, that's confusing. Where are you going with this? You just broke all biological boundaries. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God. And I just want to pause you for a second there. What just happened? Something went from saying offspring or children of Abraham, and now it is as children of God. It, it, it almost seems like it's not in the flow until you understand what? Those who are the spiritual children of Abraham, the spiritual offspring of Abraham, heirs according to the promise so that it rests on grace through faith are the children of God. Mm. But the children of the promise are counted as offspring. What promise? God made a promise. Next year I will come back and your wife Sarah will have a child. It was the child of the promise. The other child, no promise was there. Still, God's hand is in that because no child is formed in the womb apart from the work of God. But that was a child of the flesh. Isaac alone was a child of the promise and only the children of the promise are counted as offspring. And the promise is not necessarily linked to the flesh. Keep reading Galatians 3. Now the promise of Abraham, uh, uh, no, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say to his offsprings, as in many, but referring to one. What? And to your offspring, who is Christ. Whereas if I had just slowed down, and your offspring, who is People would have probably said, Isaac. I mean, isn't that the right answer? <laughs> I mean, that seems like the right answer. But Isaac was a child of the promise, pointing forward to the ultimate child of the promise, not only descendant of Abraham, but descendant of David, right? And so, wait a second. So you're saying that ultimately, this is strange. All of the promises that God gave to Abraham, ultimately those promises are promises to Christ. And we get in on those promises only in as much as we get in on Christ, right? And, and we'll see that right here. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female. Now, I just want to put this out there. With regard to the flesh, there is still Jew and Greek. With regard to the flesh, there is still slave and free. With regard to the flesh, there is still and shall always be male and female. Right? Let's not miss this. Some people use this to twist things. Some people even weirdly use this verse to, to say, see, women can be pastors too. <laughs> You've lost your mind. This says women can be saved too. You know, women can be children of the promise too. Women can be united to Christ too. Women can be saved too. Glorious citizens of heaven. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Huh. So it's not to the Jew. It's to Christ and then to everyone who has faith in Christ. Well, how does that work? Well, 2 Corinthians 5 says it this way. From now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Wouldn't that be good? We still have people who do that, right? We still have people who tend to divide church gatherings over fleshly notions, and it's tragic. Uh, we don't regard people to the flesh anymore. What it's all about is Christ, right? We should not have specialized, segmented churches based on heritage and background and culture and community. Our unity is in Christ. 
And so he says, no, the flesh, we once regarded Christ that way. We regard him that way no longer. Therefore, verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. All of this is from God, who did these things and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That's only two or four, uh, four pages, so I'm going to just speed up a bit. Um, Philippians 3 begins by saying, look out for dogs. The dogs there are a reference to the legalistic Jews who are trying to force Jewish patterns and practices, circumcision and obey the law of Moses and legalistically practice the Sabbath and just strong things trying to force that on you. And what he's saying is, basically, here's their idea. Because in the history of Israel, you had something that was called proselyte. A proselyte was a Gentile who would deny their own community and people, who would oft receive circumcision and then come under and practice the patterns of the law. And they would live like a Jew, dress like a Jew, act like a Jew, and follow the religion of the Jews. That was a proselyte. And so moving forward, many of the Jewish believers, and particularly of the circumcision party, you know, they that's what they thought. You know what? The church should be. Everybody should become Jewish. And the scripture says, no, no, no. That is not how it should be. And instead of, interestingly, these people who would have tended to look at themselves kind of like this. Let me go back for a moment to citizenship. We were born descendants of Abraham. You were adopted. So we are kind of first class Christians and you are kind of second class or third or fourth, something much lower than me. You know, that, that's the idea yeah. that would tend to be there. And then Paul uses this, which does the very opposite of elevate these professing Christians. Beware of dogs. <laughs> Again, for some of you, you're thinking of your dog that, you know, is, is bathed and combed, yeah. you know, and maybe even teeth brushed and all kinds of extraordinary things, you know, uh, healthier than some humans <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, and beautiful to see and a companion. That is not what a dog was generally in these, these days. It's an African dog. It's like an African dog. <laughs> Or an Indian dog. You know, they're, they're scavengers. <laughs> you know? They're, 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 they're ones that people avoid. And or, and or not only avoid, they look down on and mistreat. And I know this for sure, where we stay, uh, when, even now when I go to India next month, somebody is hired to walk around and kick dogs all night long. <laughs> No, I mean, it feels that way. Obviously, no, obviously, nobody's hired, but somebody all night long, dogs are just, you know, and you can hear their pain, and then and it's like, who's doing that? And why are they not sleeping? And they're hungry, you know? And then I'm trying to train the dogs to, to bite the kickers, you know? Lord, help us all. But the whole point is, Dogs are not, these are not things that you would say, beautiful, come here, come here, dog, jump up in my lap and let me embrace you. It would be like, come nothing near me, you dirty, filthy, mangy, diseased mutt. Just to put it sweetly. <laughs> you know, and, and, and they all interbreed too, so they have chromosome deficiencies and it's, it's you know, very strange, except in the village. Near our campus, most of those have all inherited a little bit of uh, German Shepherd traits from our dog. <laughs> so all the stray dogs running around the village are, are mixed German Shepherds these days. I don't know how that happened. But still dogs nonetheless. But then it says this, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Verse 3, for we are, what? The circumcision. We are, he's talking to the church in Philippi. Is that a Jewish church? No. 
And he's telling them who are not circumcised, we, me and you, including us, not the dogs, the dogs are not the circumcised, we are the circumcision, and he defines what, what marks out those who are the circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Huh? So we are the circumcision. Just note that. To say we are circumcision is like saying we are the Jews. It is like saying we are the true descendants of Abraham. Because you do know that the circumcision was attached to the covenant of Abraham, right? That was the sign of the covenant with Abraham. The Sabbath was the sign of the covenant with Israel. They had to continue to be circumcised, surely, but you have these clear uh, things. So to say we are the circumcision is to say we are the true Jew, we are the people of God, we are the inheritors of the promises, He's saying a lot there. Not dissimilar to what he says. You know, we may cover just a couple more verses and then take it up next week so as to not go too far and to not stress you out if any of you have any bodily ailments or weaknesses or physical struggles. I'm not... <laughs> how, do you, how do you know they are looking at you? <laughs> <laughs> Don't be paranoid. Uh, Romans chapter 2. And again, Paul traces these things out. And I, I would be, honestly say, if Paul and the, and the Spirit of God did not say these things the way he says them, we wouldn't accept them. Because it just breaks biology. It seems to be moving a different direction than what we thought was being said under the old covenant. But we didn't realize when it said Zion. It meant this. We didn't realize when it said offspring of Abraham, it meant Christ. We didn't realize that Jacob himself is, is again, a type of Christ. Adam is a type of Christ. So much pointed forward to Christ. Let's see what it says in Romans 2. So, if a man who is uncircumcised, again, this is a writing to the mixed church at Rome, Jews and Gentiles fighting among themselves, if a man who is uncircumcised, that's another way of saying who's not a Jew by heritage, by lineage, keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? In other words, God will look upon him and say, yes, this one is walking in my ways. He is mine. The other one, then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code of circumcision and break the law. Listen to what it says. And, and before that it had said the one who is circumcised and doesn't keep the law, his circumcision will be regarded as uncircumcision. Goes both ways. And then it explains things again that takes it away from biology and away from the flesh. Verse 28. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. Now that defies everybody's personal experience of circumcision, right? Everyone's experience was very outward and very physical. And so, but again, we have already seen laced through the Old Testament, circumcise your heart, circumcise your heart. I will circumcise your heart. I will do it. But a Jew is one inwardly and circumcision is a matter of the heart. Who circumcises the heart? The men were commanded to, but they could not, they would not, they did not. God says that he would ultimately accomplish that and he does so by his very Holy Spirit. As it says here, circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from man, but from God. And the, the sense of it is God is the one who truly knows whose heart is circumcised and who's not. You know, the, the whole idea, you take the baby, you get the baby circumcised, 
You had the baby circumcision party. Everybody claps. The baby is now into the covenant community. We have done this. And there's, there's a celebration that will take place in the community over that. Yeah, there may not be like that here, but in terms of nobody sees the heart and the praise of man is not what you're looking for. You're looking for the recognition of the one who actually sees the heart, God. Galatians 6 15 and 16 says this, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, or neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision. So whether you're Jew or Gentile doesn't matter. Whether you followed this legalistic old covenant practice or didn't doesn't matter. Now that is so offensive to a Pharisee. You know, just that that God that Paul by the Spirit had come to this place, the amount of unlearning and overcoming he would have had to do to say something like that. Shocking. But that is the great grace of God. Uh, so those things don't matter. What makes the difference? But a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy upon them and upon the Israel of God. And I'm going to give you what I think is the right translation here. The word chi is the word translated in. And the word chi has a multitude of possible translated meanings. The seventh meaning in Freeburg Analytical Lexicon of the New Testament is the one that I believe applies here in consistency with what Paul's saying in uh, even in Romans 2 before. He would be saying this, uh, a new creation is what matters. And for all who walk by this rule, the flesh doesn't matter, but the work of the Spirit in a new creation matters. Peace be and mercy be upon them, that is, or namely, upon the people of God, the Israel of God. So it's not talking about two groups there. It explains what precedes. And so, that is, namely, are valid ways of translating Kai in different contexts, okay? And so that's why sometimes, it, you know, translation is challenging. Uh, which makes me momentarily, uh, we may take this up next week, but I, since we've just spoken of translation, I just want to momentarily jump aside because be wary of things that masquerade as translations but are not. Okay, there is a growing popularity of something in, in our day and age called the Passion Translation. And passion sounds like a great thing. I mean, who doesn't want to be passionate? You know, especially as tricky as it is for a number of years, passion conferences have been going on that interestingly started out playing mostly hymns and, and you know, it's gone to different directions, but nonetheless, uh, it's become a whole movement that was very popular, widespread, these passion conferences. Thousands of young people, right, even from ETBU, journey to these conferences and, and participate in those things. And then somebody put out a passion translation that almost looks like it's the same spelling and the same font as the passion conferences. And it's being used by many of the... Uh, Online, word of faith, uh, some charismatic leading, uh, even some singers reading these things. It's even on the Bible app as, as, as a valid option. Be careful because this is what happened, the, the Passion Translation. There's a guy named Simmons. Do you know his first name? B. Simmons. Let's call him Blake. Brent. Brian Simmons, thank you for helping me. I, knew, I was getting there. The pieces were coming. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Simmons. Uh, God appeared to him and told him, or Jesus appeared to him and told him, we need another translation. And he's like, but I don't know Greek and Hebrew. So you know what God did? He touched him. I knew that he would say something like that. <laughs> right there at his hairline. You know, which is in different places for different people. But, uh, and apparently, he then said he talked to a neuroscientist 
and, and asked the neuroscientist, what would that do to a brain if God touched it? And amazingly, the neuroscientist had an answer from all the times they've tested this in the lab. <laughs> And the neuroscientist said, oh, that would make your brain power immeasurably immense. And so apparently helped him to understand the languages, all of the languages, better than anyone else who's ever translated before. And so he, one man, by himself, with made the entire translation himself, he claims from the original languages. Nobody double checking his work. And if you look at it, the guy has missed it really bad. It's an <laughs> absolute mess. You know, I'd be understating it if I said it was garbage. You know, and, 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 and so that I'm tempted to say he was not touched by God, but a demon. And I, when I said he sat there and did this all alone, I was probably wrong. He had the devil's assistance. <laughs> and, and, and what, but, but what's strange is by putting passion with it and by reworking it, every passage that didn't fit his doctrine or belief, much of which is crazy, he just tweaked it. <laughs> and, and made it say what he said. And... It is massively growing in popularity, right? Ask some of the young people. Is it growing in popularity? People are loving it because they read it and they say, wow, I, I've never read a Bible that reads like this before. It's like, yeah, it speaks to me. Oy vey, which is a Jewish response to uh, a... <laughs> That I shared in class, I was like, oh man, that's not like what I thought I was going to hear. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's sad. It's, it's really clear. I mean, I, I would not consider myself an elite biblical language scholar, but I'm familiar with the biblical languages and can make use of them. This guy knows nothing of the biblical languages at all. And I tend to think he never even got a Hebrew or Greek manuscript to work from. You know, he just probably worked from the Amplified Bible and his imagination and some nightmares. You know. so, so be careful with that. But listen, when under the inspiration of the Spirit, an apostle would come and say, uh, children, descendants of Abraham, Children of the promise, refer to those of faith, refer to Christ, refer to those united to Christ. The scripture by the Holy Spirit has the authority to do that. To say Zion did not mean Mount Zion in Jerusalem, but meant the spiritual heavenly Zion that's built upon Christ. The scripture by the Spirit of God has the right to do that. No one else does. If anyone else comes in and tries to do what the apostles did under the authority of Christ, yeah, run from those guys. And if they say Jesus met them or touched them and enlarged their brain, you know, ask for proof. Let me see your brain. All right, well, we'll, we'll call it a day. We will take this up next week, so we will go a little bit further, but that's okay. okay. We'll enjoy these studies. We want to get the most out of them. Lord, I thank you for the time that we spend, and I just thank you for your word. Many of these things, when, when reading through the Scripture and reading through the Old Testament, there's no way we would have come to, to right understandings and right conclusions of, of how these things pointed to and find, found their fullness in Christ, how they point to the, those who have faith in Christ as those who in union with him become themselves offspring of Abraham. The fact that all of your purposes were not bound up in the flesh with regard to your intention, but those things served a purpose uh, to show your pattern, to show your plan, to show your holiness, to show your power, to show your wrath, to show your mercy, and uh, then eventually to send your son and make known your so great salvation. Lord, we pray that 
we would make it known to people from all places, all tribes, all communities, and all backgrounds. And we thank you, Lord, that from all places, even those of great enmity, you are taking one from that city, two from that country. You are registering them among your people as having been born there. That new birth, that new creation that takes place by your spirit within us, uniting us to Christ. Thank you, O oh God, for doing that for us and help us to understand the significance of those things in the days in which we live and even how they pertain to your promises and our inheritance. We pray that you'll continue to help us as we study these things, Lord, in Jesus' name.